when I, I use the default, can you guys see? Yeah. It's, it's, no, there's some sparks around here. But the moment, let's see if we can hear that. Mm -hmm. One second delay. When I use the default, can you guys see? Yeah. It's, no, there's some sparks around here. At the moment. Yeah, now it's audible. Yeah, you were muted. Okay, I didn't even realize. Okay. Okay. Okay, and now this chat is coming from. So just move this chat somewhere so that I can, because I probably won't see it. Looks the last one was chat. Okay, but it's it, it, it's okay. Yeah, because I was thinking that I will just make this smaller anyway. Will this window stay? No. Ah, this one. Yeah, I don't uh, want the presenter view. Uh, this the, is HTML. No, this is it. But here, just a display view. You can change it. The first one is, I think, HDMI. Ah, so there was also presenter view. OK. Okay. I think not as long as it's working. Like if if you monitor it remotely and you see that something is off then then just let me know. He mentioned that he has some other meeting that he might come or might not. Yeah. Okay, so we'll wait 5 more minutes and then we start. Sure. Yep. It's the five seconds when they make the censorship. So the guy in India is just watching the video. Ah, stop. That's not going to fly on YouTube. I think so. It just appeared magically in my office today morning. So I was in the Jamie Heinemann Center, then I came to the office and I said, we magic. I have a gift. <laughs> I guess that's exactly it.
I think I that see. I think that I should use the whole time. So, so Aki planned it. Let me just see. One and a. No, he he planned it one and a half hours. So I'll do eleven thirty. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. A quarter to yeah, because he started from ten sharp and it's ten fifteen. Yeah, I think that I can speed up at some point. So I'll just oh, try no, to. It's fine. It depends on the inspiration that comes today, because I, I just come with whatever comes in my mind during the lecture. So sometimes it takes longer, sometimes shorter. But I can make it. I can make it six hours if necessary. <laughs> Okay, so I guess we can slowly start. It's roughly the time for, for the beginning of the lecture. So today I'll present you introduction to modeling of human musculoskeletal system or introduction to biomechanics. And uh, my name is Adam Klodowski. I'm an associate professor in the laboratory of machine design, work, working with Aki. And um, biomechanics is still kind of an active topic at LUT. Uh, we do some uh, more or less related to biomechanic things. Like, like nowadays, we're working on uh, monitoring sportsman performance, uh, building the device to uh, model wheelchair racing, um, force production, how, how it is distributed, as well as uh, similar setup for cross-country skiing, so that you could actually monitor your style and, and performance. Mm, we used to work most, more closely to the mechanics of the human body, which you will see mostly in this presentation. So initial topics were introduced, uh, like uh, human modeling, we are modeling walking, strains and stresses in the bones, and things like that. So I'll try to go through wide range of applications for biomechanics that you can see, so that you would have an overview. I won't go into far details about how the things are working, but just try to scratch the surface so that if you ever decide that you want to do something related to biomechanics, you have a feeling of what it actually involves, because this discipline is very wide, similar like mechanical engineering. Biomechanics, you can actually put it inside the mechanical engineering, so that's like a subclass. And uh, when it comes to applications, there's, there's really a lot of them. So mostly interesting applications relate to sport engineering but also to some sort of uh, prosthesis design or rehabilitation or understanding basically the mechanics of, of the body. So let's go step by step. So what is the motivation? So one of the motivation is the prosthesis design and optimization. And as you can see, um, the, the first picture shows uh, damaged cartilage in the knee. So basically the surface should be smooth and it's covered with some kind of a liquid that serves as a lubricant. 
And that's something that is really impossible to engineer. So we don't have materials that are having so low friction and so good performance as the real thing. And whenever we install a prosthesis, we usually use the engineering materials which are biocompatible. So basically they should not degrade, they should not get rusty, they should not um, influence the tissues around it. But as you can see, this is like titanium or some other um, relatively expensive materials and they are often metals of some sort. And because of that, you have to understand that they will behave differently than the natural cartilage. And when you assemble those two pieces together, um, we have a few degrees of freedom in the knee. In, in theory, it's just a hinge joint. In practice, it actually is able to move in all three directions when it comes to rotation, and you can actually stretch it even a little bit. Um, so the rings here, which are called ligaments, are actually keeping the joint together. And then the shape of the cartilage uh, under the pressure uh, determines what is the movement trajectory. So if you're moving your knee straight or if it kind of bends to the side during the movement, these are sometimes the small deviations, but uh, if you look at how people are walking, you can actually notice the differences. So if you design a prosthesis uh, element, well, you cannot just go and say, this is a standard prosthesis, let's just install it. You need to do some sort of optimization per patient. And if you adjust the size so that it matches the knee, if you adjust the shape, um, then you can give a better quality of life for walking. So basically people can walk more symmetrically if they have just one surgery on one knee. Um, another thing is, uh, for example, a hip implant. So here you have this kind of a pin. And of course the hip can be represented as a ball joint and it's pretty accurate representation. But now if you think uh, about this ball joint, there is this big pin that has to um, be attached to the bone using some specific cement or, or glue that, that is biocompatible. And there is a certain problem with uh, that attachment. So one could think that, okay, I have an anchor, I just fix it, it's done. It, it works that way with the engineering materials, which are not alive. But when the bone is alive, it always adapts to loading. So when it feels that there's not enough loading somewhere, it just disappears. The cells are taken away. And in the places where there's a much loading, there's more cells being built so that the bone becomes stronger. So if you're exercising, your bones become stronger. If you do nothing, they just go towards light weight. It's, it's part of the optimization. So if you don't need that trend, reduce the mass and you're lighter. It's, it's something that we do in engineering all the time. We try to shave off the mass from everything that is moving so we can get the benefit in lower energy consumption. Body is doing the same thing. But uh, with this attachment, the problem is if the load is not transmitted in a specific way to the bone, this implant gets loose. And when it gets loose, it means that you need another surgery. And that's of course problematic, painful and unnecessary stress. I don't know how durable they are nowadays, but uh, usually you would like to install them once and, and forget about it. If you need to uh, replace them, that's that's something that is, first of all, a big cost. And secondly, it's, it's kind of a problematic for the patients as well, because once you get used to something, you just try to use it. So there is need to be some optimization also of those uh, elements, and they can be done on kind of a generic level because you just have to know how the bones are built and how you actually optimize the shape of that pin so that it would stay uh, well within the bone. Then in some cases we use uh, prostheses which are kind of outside of the body. Like this is an example of a mechanical foot. So if you you can have a wooden foot if you like uh, as a replacement, and that's like. Uh, Captain's hook um, idea of, of uh, let's say, a medicine. But uh, in many cases, you can get something more uh, professional and something that gives you more feeling of a real leg. So our legs are, basically our feet are bending in the middle. And that's important part of the gait. If the foot is flat, then we cannot regain the energy from every step, we basically waste the energy on every step and then we have to put it back. So our gait starts to be asymmetric if you have just one prosthesis like that, and it starts to be more robotic and less less human. And of course, all those shocks are going through our spine and that's uh, not the nicest feeling. So if you can design a prosthesis uh, which uh, can 
have some mechanical system. This is an idea of a system which uses purely passive elements. So they, it uses spring to absorb the energy during impact. So that also serves as a damping. And then um, it uses the same spring with some unlocking mechanism to actually free that energy when you're propelling yourself forward um, in, in a push-off phase. And then, of course, the system resets and, and, and repeats. So that's mostly related to walking because walking is quite of a common activity. You, it, it's a basic need. So in that case, um, if this can help, uh, you need to design it. And of course, the stiffness of the spring, the dimensions of the whole foot, uh, place of the pivot joint, um, places at like angles at which this mechanism should lock and unlock this has to be optimized so if you would get the task like design this and you have just the idea like okay this is more or less how it should look like the first thing you need to study is what i'm expecting to have how, how it should work for a specific person so if you have a, somebody who is smaller you will make smaller steps so the angles are slightly different when he approaches the ground and when he pushes off if you have a taller person then again the geometry slightly changes and of course with the change of weight, you have some tolerance, of, of course, but uh, the, the better you can tune your parameters, uh, the better performance you will achieve. Um, in other places, we can think about optimization, even thinking about uh, the air drag. So for example, for ski jumping, this was the typical technique long time ago. And of course, once you look how the air drag looks like, you can think of optimizing. So how they change the style from um, jumping like with the uh, skis in parallel to, to changing to the V shape. It was a lot of optimization like that. So you can think that here the biomechanics doesn't look inside your body, but mostly concentrates on how you can use your body to get certain effects when you're interacting with the environment. And of course, ski jumping is a activity when you're flying. So um, during the flying phase, what is the most important is how you use the air drag so it, it study like like for the airplane or a bird you want to see what what gives you the best uh, lift force and how you can reduce the uh, front drag that slows you down so that you can jump as far as possible and using this kind of optimization and trying in the virtual environment you can actually try crazy styles before you figure out oh this is actually safe and of course then you can proceed to the simulation of landing and during landing, you have to make sure that the energy that you're dealing with is absorbed. So that part can be, for example, when you're designing the skis, they have this kind of an arc shape. So that's part of the absorption of the shocks whenever you're landing. Mm. And of course, you can add intermediate elements, which, which add some compliance during the landing. Um, when you're on the run in the beginning and you're just getting the velocity, again, you can look at the aerodynamics, you can look at the friction. Uh, you can look at many perspectives which affect, first of all, your uh, final speed, because that affects how far you will jump. And secondly, um, what kind of loading it causes to your body. Is it still safe? Because let's say if you're building a space rocket, uh, you can accelerate it quite quickly, but then how much the person can handle inside if you put someone there. So if you just send equipment, you can, the, the material durability is the limit. If you're um sending somewhere people uh you need to make sure that they can actually survive um, all the forces that are applied to them um there's also a exercising equipment design so if you're for example designing this kind of an orbit track like the first thing is like what is the geometry so we know that there's some eccentricity in the motion but what is the proportion between the arm movement and leg movement and for example, how you design in the adjustment for different size of people. So if you have a small girl exercising on it or a large man, um, how this should scale up? Is it proportional, the motion of the hands and the motion of the knees, or is it somehow have to be adjusted separately? And that tells you like basically what you can do in the design. And it's up to you how complicated you make it. So you can have two separate systems for hands and arms uh, and legs, and then you can uh, couple it, let's say, electronically, or like here, you can couple it mechanically, and then you have to figure out some kind of a ratio of the motion. And of course, if you want to make this effective uh, as an exercising device, the first thing you need to try is what range of motion you want to really achieve. So 
there is always a motivation that okay people let's say running on the treadmill do certain loading to their joints to certain range of motions if they are doing something else they have another range of motion and another loading so if you design this exercising machine what it should change compared to the previous devices so it's kind of similar to the bicycle it's kind of similar to the treadmill in the perspective that you're actually standing but you're moving the whole body so somebody had an idea that okay let's move the whole body and of course before you come up with a right design of this it's nice to actually put a human mannequin there and first study the kinematics and see how the motion is uh, beneficial and secondly go to studying what is the dynamics so how it changes the loading in the body and maybe you can for example improve uh, let's say make sure that there's no overloaded uh, conditions in any of the joints now a rowing simulator kind of similar idea if you think about how you would like to study it so what should be the proportions again how high you should put the place uh, the, the the fan which, which should uh, simulate the resistance the idea of using actually a fan there is kind of interesting that um, it has this kind of a non-linear behavior so if you try to pull uh, quicker uh, the force is increasing kind of uh, steeply compared if you try to do it gently which which is kind of similar behavior to what you do if you try to row on a real river and and when you're pulling um, this relation is also non-linear so if you for example study uh, a normal person kayaking and find out what is the relationship between the angles and force and, and speed um, then you can use those relationships from your biomechanical model to build a machine that will simulate it as accurately as possible and you can use different techniques you can have an electric um, motor which is basically used as a brake you can have uh, like say purely mechanical system which uses either water or air uh, to produce the drag and you just try to fit it to to give the same uh, kind of a feeling then there are some devices that i use most like for fun so this i like external uh, like I could call it an exoskeleton which you add on your legs and you can use it for jumping and i think i had a picture here yeah so it allows you to jump quite high so there's a spring mechanism that allows you to store the energy and reuse it to, to jumping and of course before you put something like that to the market you want to make sure that it's kind of a safe so you can either find a lot of crazy guys who will just try around and that's probably also always required but uh, before you break somebody's legs you want to make sure that um, you can absorb enough energy while landing uh, that you have enough stiffness so that you can actually jump high and um, you have to figure out how you adjust the mechanism for different sizes of people for different weights and uh, conditions so with that kind of design again you need to focus on what is the human motion what is the loading and what is your what are your design parameters and sometimes you can obtain them from from that kind of models um, crash test uh, something that you don't want to experience in real life but if it happens you would like to make sure that you covered all the bases so you don't want surprises with the car deformation that causes some harm so of course from the mechanical perspective you first look at the car uh, behavior and there were lots of things discovered in the first crash test like for example that the steering column should not be straight thing it should actually break otherwise the uh, steering wheel was penetrating human's pelvis and that was dangerous um, after studying a lot of accidents actually people figure out that there's something wrong with that design and something has to be different and then the design changed uh, seat belts again Attaching mass of the human body to the mass of the car allows the deceleration to be more gentle and prevent you from flying away uh, as, as a projectile from the car. So again, um, if you design the seat belts, they are not totally rigid. They are actually elastic and after one crash, you have to replace them because they get stretched. But the stretching of them is actually what you want to absorb the energy. So you want to gradually uh, take the energy and not cause a damage uh, because person cannot move in rally cars you might want to have stiffer uh, belts you might want to have the five points of attachment so that the person is really rigidly attached but then you build a frame all around the car uh, to make sure that it's rigid enough 
in F1 cars, for example, there is the front part, which is like absorbing the energy. So you can see quite spectacular crashes at 300 kilometers per hour and the person just shakes his head and saying, okay, I'm going out and I'm feeling fine, even though the parts are falling apart. But thanks to the biomechanical studies and mechanical engineering studies, we could actually predict different ways how those crashes are happening and how you want to absorb the energy, which parts you can actually shrink without damaging the person and how you should provide the protection. The same goes for the airbags. If you design the airbag, there's the explosive material inside, which have to just fill in the bag in a quick uh, time. And uh, you want to make sure that it's quick enough, but it's not damaging yourself. Um, there were a couple of accidents when um, some car brands had a problem where the airbags were, for example, exploding randomly when the car was stationary. And uh, some people get damage to the face uh, because it wasn't kind of uh, in the right moment. And of course, there, there's plenty of other uh, safety factors that uh, allow you to design even the shape of the airbag so that uh, it, it kind of fits to your human body and, and take the energy again gradually without uh, causing some harm. So well, after this lengthy introduction, we can go to what the biomechanics really is. So the definition is quite simple. When we apply the mechanical principles to some biological structures, uh, then we can talk about uh, biomechanics. And it can be in different levels. So we can think about the human, animal, but we can go also to the molecular level or cell level and try to look the biomechanical uh, principles, how they, how they work there. And it's also a completely fine uh, application of the biomechanics. So in the course of engineering, we usually deal with man-made structures and they comprise of three key components. So what is depicted here as a steel beam is basically a structure. So we need something to hold things together. Uh, if we're talking about the machine, there's something moving, so we need an actuator. So we have the actuators, either hydraulic, electric, whichever um, way we want to move it. And then we need to have some kind of a control system that uh, makes this actuation let's say, reasonable. Uh, in the old days, let's say the excavators were controlled kind of uh, manually. So you had the proportional valves and you had to have a feeling how to do it. And of course, depending on your skill, you could actually damage your excavator pretty quickly if you were overloading. Today, if we add the middleman, which is the electronics, they can actually measure certain parameters, change of pressure, and make sure that the valves are opened more smoothly. And this way you can extend the fatigue life of all the components. So even if the controls from the human are really hectic and not, not making sense, you can actually correct it. But anyway, those three components are there. Uh, you can, of course, think about the joints. And I would include the joints mostly in, in between somewhere the actuation and, and the structure. But uh, they, they are there. And now if you try to apply the same thing to a human body or some other organism, you have also the same three structures. So you have bones as a load carrying uh, structure. So that's basically your frame. Then you have muscles as actuators, quite complex, nonlinear, but they'll do the job. And of course, that is like a parallel manipulation almost all the time. And then you have the brain as or central nervous system as a control algorithm uh, for sending signals to all of that. And it, the analogy is quite uh, quite straightforward. So you can think of the modeling concept will be also very similar. So let's see how we look at this from the engineering perspective. So whenever we have excavator or a human, we always convert it to a set of flying potatoes, springs, dampers, and forces. So we just look which parts are, let's say, rigid, or we can assume that they are rigid. Like, for example, if you think about the rib cage, you can either model individual every single rib and then the joints between those ribs, which are relatively stiff. And in some cases, this is uh, the required level of detail. But you can also assume that this is a rib cage, this is one rigid body, I'm fine with that. Uh, the same goes for, for different other uh, bones. So sometimes we have some bones that are fused together uh, quite closely, and then we can model them as one rigid body or flexible body, or we can model this as a set interconnected bodies with some forces, springs, dampers in between. Nevertheless, the mathematical description behind that 
once you have the set of bodies and uh, forces in between. So in general case, you have just bodies and forces, nothing else. Um, to make it more, uh, let's say, understandable, we introduce the concept of the joints, which basically usually are ending up either as a constraint equations, or they are represented also using some kind of uh, penalty formulation as forces, which are calculated so that a certain constraint would be fulfilled. Then we can have springs. So again, if you think about the spring, you can think of it as a spring, or you can think straight away as the force which comes from the spring uh, equation. The same comes for the damper. So when we form the equations that you should be more or less familiar with from the course that Aki is giving, um, then we are already having a mathematical problem to solve. So formulation of the problem starts with the same idea. Divide the system into multiple bodies, find out where are the joints, describe the joint constraints. So is this joint a revolute joint? Is it some kind of bushing joint so that it can move in all the direction, but with a limited, um, limited movement? Is it a sliding joint or anything else? Well, in engineering, you will have a lot of sliding joints. And, and such. In biomechanics, most of the joints are rotary joint and they never rotate, let's say, constantly. So there's always kind of a initial angle of like maximum uh, limits of the angle, angular rotation for every joint. So if we go through here, I don't know why this is going for the second time. Now, when it comes to joints, we can have different level of assumptions. And that's really important when you model a system. Uh, if you model an excavator and you have a pin joint, you can just assume that it's a hinge. And that's a valid assumption for most of the studies. And the same you can do, for example, with the human. If you look at the knee, you can say, OK, there's a hinge joint. I'm happy with that. That's, that's good enough. And if you study walking um, with the range of motion that people do in the knee during walking, that's quite valid. But if you try to study squatting, where you have a big range of motion in the knee, then the hinge joint is starting to have some limitations when it comes to accuracy, because the actual rotation axis in the joint is kind of moving. So it doesn't stay in the same planes just because there are two uh, surfaces which are touching and they are rotating with respect to another. Uh, another. And it's not only that the uh, hinge line is shifting and moving around, but it's also tilting because of the shape. So that uh, makes it more complicated. And again, if you really care about those details, you have to go to something more elaborate. And that would be, okay, like something like this. So then you try to model the geometry of the cartilage. Then you introduce the ligaments, which are some sort of a spring and damper combinations for us. And now how it works mechanically. So the ligaments keep those things compressed so that when you lift your leg from the ground, you don't have the bottom leg hanging by the skin. Of course, the skin helps, but mostly the ligaments keep it together. But when you load it, of course, this is the surface that, uh, uh, let's say, take the most load. But then you need also the ligaments so that it wouldn't just slide or separate. So the, the ligaments are also uh, constraining the rotation so that you wouldn't rotate the knee like this. And if they are damaged, that's basically what can happen and that can cause a lot of pain. So if you want to be accurate, you want to go to this kind of a level and get the accurate representation. Now, the difficulty is like how you get the geometry of a specific person. So you can use some generic geometry, and that's a first starting point. And once you see that your model is kind of stable and you have the geometry that doesn't have some uh, problematic mathematical shapes in there, uh, you can try to reconstruct the geometry from a real human using some imaging techniques. Of course, this representation introduces far more equations to, to your solver. So you have to, so that's a trade-off. Either you make it simple and you just introduce few constraints or you make it more accurate and then you introduce a bunch of uh, elements and of course that's a bunch of parameters that you need to identify because if you have a hinge joint you just have a hinge joint and the forces are calculated and that's it um, so you just have to determine the location of the hinge that makes sense but if you have uh, ligaments there then you have to get what is their stiffness what is their damping coefficients and they might be different for each single ligament and also you have to uh, in, figure out what is the friction in the joint 
uh, what what kind of surface pressure they, they can exist and, and that kind of things that you later on calculate. So if we think about the uh, biomechanics, we have two approaches mostly. And uh, nowadays, they rarely live separated from each other. It used to be so that some people really focus on the experimental methods, the other use the computational methods. But uh, while the experiment, experimental methods could live somehow separately from the computational methods, and they are used in many cases, the computational methods always require the experimentation part. I mean, you, you don't have to do the experiment yourself, but you need to have the results that you can use to compare your data. So when you're building a computational model, these are just numbers. And uh, you, if you use finite element model and you have, let's say, one centimeter long beam and you apply some force, if you make it very elastic, you can calculate deflection of one meter. It doesn't make physical sense. It's, it's total nonsense, but numerically it's possible to calculate those numbers. So, and, and it won't, you won't see any error messages. You will just see a number that makes no sense. So once you make a model, which is something more complex than a beam, uh, you need to have some numbers that you can run uh, tests and see how accurate you're actually getting. So that's where the experimental methods and validation is really important. In the experimental methods, just to name a few, we have motion analysis. This was one of the very first methods that was really widely used, especially when the photography started to be popular and high-speed photography. People started recording motion of different animals, people. They were intrigued how this is actually happening. And straight away, they focus on sports because there the motion is the most um, intriguing, oh, also dances and, and stuff like that. Uh, today, for the motion analysis, we also use motion capture, where we try to uh, get markers on the body and, and get the uh, actual positions of the joints, not only recording the whole posture and then trying to basically draw on top of it. Uh, we can measure external forces. So if you're lifting weights, you could have some sensors in your hands to actually know how much you're grasping to the barbell, how much you're actually lifting, uh, what are the accelerations that you're causing using accelerometer, uh, accelerometer sensors. Um, you can measure a force if you punch into something, or if you're standing on the ground, you can have a ground uh, reaction force measured by the force plates or, or some other uh, force sensing a mat. We can measure also muscle activity called EMG signals, so electromyography. So placing electrodes on the skin allows you to kind of capture what is the control signal coming in. And here is an interesting thing. The control signal is not really linear. So it's uh, to some extent linear, and other times it just changes quite dramatically. And that's not exactly uh, easily correlated with the muscle forces. There, there's lots of studies which assume there is a linear correlation. That's kind of assumed uh, way of, of doing this. Uh, but whenever you look at the details, you can see that uh, there's quite a lot of drift, especially when you have high forces product produced by muscles. You can measure maximum oxygen consumption, lungs capacity. You can measure some kind of timing elements from, from sport exercises. So there's plenty of things you can actually measure. The benefit of the method is basically that you know what you measured, so it's relatively easy to interpret your data. Of course, if what you measure is not correlating with what you're expecting, then it's a little bit of a struggle. But otherwise, it should be quite straightforward. And because you measure quite directly what you want, um, I would say that it's not very ambiguous. It's quite reliable as long as your setup is, uh, let's say, sound. But there is a lot of limitations. So first of all, if you try to measure signals which are changing quickly, so you want to have, let's say, 100 or 1,000 hertz uh, sampling rate, you start to run into a problem how you actually get all that data in time. When you have multiple sensors, you need to synchronize them. So you can have multiple devices that measure something, and then you would like to see this together, like, for example, motion capture and electromyography. So you need to have a common timing somehow reference. So you, you sync all the devices. You have to remember that whenever you have electronics and times, um, the time flies in a different rate a little bit on every device. So they drift apart. And if this drift is small enough, uh, you can live with it, but you just have to have, let's say, a starting point synchronized. 
if if the drift is larger, then then you have a more problem. You need to synchronize more frequently. Um, preparation of the experiment is generally a downside. It usually takes a lot of thinking and a lot of time to prepare. And there is limited amount of sensors that you can attach because the sensors have a physical size. And for example, if you have an IMU with a battery, it will be some kind of a small box. So you cannot put a lot of them in a small area. If you have strain gauges to attach somewhere, again, they have certain size. And if you start attaching them everywhere, you're actually adding a shell on your structure. If the structure is really thin, you actually add artificial stiffness that was not there. Um, some of the measurements would cause damage and not always you want to allow that. So that, that this is a clear limitation where we want to use the computational studies. And in the computational, we can start with static analysis. So we can just draw certain posture, apply the loads and calculate what are the uh, joint loads. And this is very useful just to give like rough understanding of what we're expecting. So if you know like a range of dynamic external loadings, you can just apply them to a person or animal or something and do the static analysis to see what is the range of values that you're expecting somewhere. You can go a step forward and start make things move. And then you have the kinematic analysis. And in the kinematic analysis, you're focusing on the motion. So if you have a complex relation, like for example, the sport equipment, which uh, composes the motion of multiple body joints, then you can see how the body is moving. And you can study, for example, so if my device is moving, I don't know, 20 degrees left and right, and then person is grasping it, uh, what will be his motion of different joints? And then I can optimize to, let's say, get it uh, in, in the range where, which I'm expecting to get. If you're interested on the stresses and strains, then finite element analysis comes in handy. And similarly, like in mechanical engineering, you basically need to know the material properties, geometry, then figure out some kind of element for uh, for meshing your uh, geometry. And then, then you can apply the external loads and see how it's the deformation. And that's really widely used. Um, like, for example, if you would like to study what happens when you're biting, the biting forces are quite large. And you could see how the jaw is loaded. And then it also can help to solve some mysteries of, for example, adaptation between different animals. So if you take an Asian animal and you just excavate him, you can link, oh, sharp teeth, so probably uh, a meat eater. Uh, if, if, if it doesn't have sharp teeth, then, then most likely it was eating plants. But um, if you can, for example, apply different forces to the, to the teeth, you can actually calculate what it could actually bite. So if it has strong teeth and big jaw, can it break, for example, a bone of this animal or the other animal? So using the finite element, you can get the range of what would be the stresses. And you know, okay, if he tries to bite uh, some something large, then he will break his teeth, so he's not able to uh, actually bite those bones. But with those, he can, for example, smash them. And also you can calculate what is the forces that they can actually create. So if you know where are the muscle attachment points on the bones, you know the geometry of the bones with the finite element you can calculate okay so if this is the muscle size this is the strength for the muscle fiber per per area then i can calculate what kind of forces the guy uh, can create in different places and this could help for example study what is the locomotion speed and so on so the things we know today about dinosaurs is mostly coming from this kind of analysis where we run finite element or multi-body uh, analysis on, on, on the skeletons and see what they could do. And there is quite a lot of discrepancies because there's lots of parameters that you have to guess. And if I remember correctly for T-Rex, the biting force was uh, something like 100 times between the lowest and the highest estimate for what it is. So it's not super accurate if you don't have good reference data. So that's what shows that you need some experimental um, study to back it up. If things are moving and we concentrate on the motion, then we go to multibody dynamics. And it's great whenever we can assume that things are rigid. Bones are pretty rigid, so you can do multibody dynamics on them. But if you would like to know the stresses inside, then you have to go to flexible multibody dynamics, which is a mix of finite element and multibody dynamics, or component mode synthesis and multibody dynamics. And then you can see what happens inside the body, which is elastic. You can take the elasticity into account, which have some kind of a dumping effect as well. And uh, you can study the most details there. 
the great benefit of computational methods is that you can have infinite number of measurement points. So you can decide how accurate is your mesh in final me element. You can calculate point on any place on the surface or, or contact. All points are always accessible. So you have a perfect X-ray to look at individual zones. And if you want to have, uh, let's say, a graph of how the pressure distribution looks like on, on some joint, you can just do it. If you try to measure it, well, that would be really difficult to place finite amount of sensors on small area, and you would have to have a lot of interventions. So you have access to internal parameters. That's, that's really great. The, the whole simulation is usually non-invasive. So you just make a model of someone, and then you get the result. But there are limitations and shortcomings. First of all, how do you check that your results are actually matching the reality? If you, for example, compute forces which are inside your body, and you're not able to measure them, how do you verify that they are correct? The only way you can do it is through some validation. So you, for example, measure the external forces, measure whatever you can from the external body, and then compare if those external measurements also match. And if you say that, okay, they match within, let's say, 5%, then you can assume that the internal forces also are within the same tolerance if the material properties and a couple of other assumptions are sound. So that adds a little bit of variability what we can um, how accurately we can measure. But if you use different methods and come up with, let's say, the similar results, then you know that, okay, let's say during running, the forces in the knee are in the range of 10 times the body weight. And that's, uh, that's, a, that's a fair assumption from most studies. You can just see it. Um, also, building specific, like person-specific models, not a generic model that, oh, I have a human with some random dimensions, but I want to have this specific guy, uh, it's kind of time-consuming. You need to first get the geometry, get the body parameters, somehow estimate the masses of individual body parts. So it, it might differ depending on your BMI and, and a couple of other things. Uh, just to have a glimpse of what it means to measure so on the top left corner here, uh, you have a prosthesis which have a wireless transmitting device, and that allows to measure the forces in the cartilage. So there were two subjects, if I remember correctly, one was male, one was female, who were implanted with that. And of course, you cannot embed a battery inside a human because it would leak at some point. So the power is basically transmitted wirelessly, just like your wireless charger. So it uses the coils to and and the changing current to transmit the energy from the outside. And they, of course, were used to, so this is basically how it looks more or less inside. So there's some strain gauges. So you have like two or three points of measurements where you can see what is the loading. And that loading could be used to estimate what is the loading in the knee. And of course, because the prosthesis is different than the real knee, it, and when you walk with prosthesis, you walk slightly differently. It doesn't give you exactly the same values that would give you a healthy knee. But you get a very interesting insight of what is the ballpark of the values that we can expect. Then uh, there are cadaveric studies, which is like here. So basically, you take a bone from a dead person, attach some sensors, then there's no problem, or, or some artificial cartilage to this. And then you put it to a robot, which will move the two things together. Looks really ugly, if you think about it. Uh, but it gives interesting information. So you have a real bone that uh, is subject to specific loading. You can apply the loading simulating how the muscles would do or the external loads. And then you can measure what happens in between. So you have some information of what is there because otherwise you wouldn't know nothing. And that is place for the data that you can get for validation of the things. Um, here in the bottom, there's a tibia bone with strain gauges, again, cadaveric specimen, then it's subject to bending, and then we can see what are the stresses in those locations. And as you can see, the size of a strain gauge is like maybe one centimeter, a radius that you have there. So you cannot place them everywhere. So you can see certain spots uh, where you can see the strains, and that you can compare with your model. And if your model gives you good results in those spots, you can assume that in between, uh, with the final resolution, you can get also decent results. And of course, there's lots of cabling. This all adds a weight. This all adds a hassle to uh, to actually manage it. So th these are the limitations. There's another um, implant here is the implant for the hip. 
the same idea like here for the knee. So basically there's an induction coil for transmitting the energy and data. And then there is a load cell here that allows to uh, measure the six forces, uh, like three forces and, and three torques there. Um, and give some information like what are the hip joint loads? Again, in a prosthesis, not in the real hip, but as long as the geometry is kind of resembled uh, correctly, you can assume that it is in the ballpark of the results that you can think of. Um, this is a setup for motion capture. This is a few years old, and here we use the visual cameras. So the cameras seeing the, the visual light. Nowadays, you mostly use infrared cameras because then uh, you can see basically the markers and you don't care about the background at all because the background will not be reflected in that, in that light. So you can easily uh, cut it out in the digital transformation. Uh, here, there was a black background behind the guy uh, so that we can actually see the markers and he had a black suit so that we don't see him. Uh, but just uh, the thing. And of course, what looks like a bomb attached to his chest is basically a device for measuring EMG signals from the muscles. So he had a bunch of electrodes attached to his legs. Um, and of course, there's a wiring underneath the clothing. And then there was a box with a battery and uh, um, the measuring equipment so that it can collect the data and transmit and also get the synchronization signal from the motion capture and so on. There is a photo cell standing here. Uh, with a reflective element. So this was basically end of the walk path. And in the floor, there were long force platforms. So when he was walking, we were able to measure three force components for every leg. Um, and the, when he passed the first gate, we kind of triggered the measurement, got like two or three steps that he's making in the measurement. And then he passed the other one. And that was another synchronization uh, signal to, to set to a stop. And on the right hand side, you have basically the rest of the setup, which was not visible in the picture. So you can see that it's not, not really portable. So if you want to make this kind of experiment, you have a lot of cables, you have a lot of elements, and they are kind of fixed in the lab. Now, imagine that you want to measure a skier in his natural environment, and you're, I don't know, driving a van next to him, and the cables are kind of dragged behind him. That wouldn't be a really nice option. Uh, and it's not really doable. So uh, there are now different methods, and you can actually have a real-time motion capture outside also. Uh, you just have to watch out with the light condition. Like snow is quite difficult because it's so reflective that if you have the infrared, you just see white everywhere. So then the accelerometer-based systems seem to be uh, more reliable in that si sense, but they also have a drawback that they drift. So they, they drift off from the from the course. So as long as the measurement is relatively short, a couple of minutes, you can get decent results. If it's longer, then you start to I have to start thinking about some reference points where you would get, let's say, a motion capture with uh, external devices with optics in some places that you would see this is the real pose. So you can kind of uh, make a correction to the trajectories that you're getting. Uh, this is another setup. So the guy is not going into space, but he's just pushing a weight with his back and sliding. And on his uh, tie here, there is the ultrasound head. So basically, you can see the muscle and ligament stretching during the exercise. So that's what gives you some elements. And then he has a couple of um, electrodes on the legs to see the signals that are going to the muscle. So then you see the signals to, uh, going to the muscle stretch in the ligament. Uh, you know the force that he's applying because you, you see the weight moving and you have the motion capture which tells you how, how he's moving it. And then you can use that to build a computational model and see what happens actually in his knees because we won't cut them to put some sensors inside, but we can simulate what happens inside and if this is too straining for him or not. The other thing is to um, like a torque sensor. So it measures how much you can press the pedal. And that's the way to measure the forces of the muscles, which are actually actuating your ankle joint. So again, whenever you model a person, you would like to know what is his actual strength. So you need to say, uh, like for specific uh, signal that the muscle is getting, how much force you're producing. And this is kind of a setup to get it from one muscle or the other. And you can have different setups for different muscles. And then you have some experimental data that you can use for your model uh, to get it more accurate. And let's go forward. Yes, and here is an example with the motion capture, which was already using the infrared sensor. So the person walks on those long wooden platforms, and those are force platforms. But there are those gray 
two force platforms on the top, uh, which which are short, but they give us uh, more accurate results and three components. The long force platform, are like I think they are like 10 meters long. So you can imagine that they are less accurate than something small. But of course, it, you just have to make it a few times so that the person is not really aiming at those platforms, but you just want him to stop making natural gait as possible. So then you have for two um, heel strikes and then toe off uh, phases, you can see what happens really accurately. And on the whole walking, you get the, the measurement um, to see how he's, how he's performing. And this was the overview of the setup there. So basically, there was some kind of a long beam on the top where the cameras at the ends were attached. There were two cameras here in front and their angle. Lots of lights when this was like a visual system so that you could have a recording at high frequency. And then there was a black background to make sure that you have uh, you can eliminate the markers from the background. And in the middle, there was a light that was visible on all the cameras. So each camera records individually. So then if you have the flash of light at some point, then you can kind of trim the uh, videos to set, oh, this is my starting point. And the same signal was used for, for others, um, other measurement equipment in the, let's say, digital form. Now, when we establish the motion of the body, we usually need to attach something to the body to, to have an easier grasp of what's going on. So what we have, we, we just put the markers. And there are some protocols how you put the markers. Basically, on a freely moving body, if you put three markers, you can actually detect how it is oriented in 3D space. Now, if you have a body which is with interconnected joints and they uh, introduce some constraints, you might use less than three per individual segment. So for example, if you have a hand, it's attached to the wrist, uh, to the forearm, and basically uh, you can just decrease the number of those because you know that the joint keeps this together, doesn't stretch. Or anything. So there are some protocols and the the names which are kind of cryptic. Maybe at first they are just uh, naming the locations of the the body. Then when you get n videos, so the more cameras you have, the better. You need at least two. Two is like really minimalistic, so you could have like two intersecting planes, and then you could see motion in one plane, motion in the other plane, just attach it together, and you would get the three directional coordinates of those. But if you have multiple cameras, then you can actually average out all the errors and you get pretty accurate positioning. So then you have to do the camera calibration. So camera has optics. You need to calibrate how to transform a pixel to a physical location. So for example, if you are two pixels away on a single camera in a specific part of the image where you are in the reality. So that, uh, that thing you have to do from camera calibration, there's like a matrix of, of parameters to, to fill, and you can just get it and, and do it. it. It used to be done partially manual. Now it's quite a lot automatic. So you basically move some kind of a magic wand in the air, uh, swapping the space. And the magic wand has like several markers with known distances. And uh, then basically the processing software is uh, figuring out, OK, where it is in different spaces, and it does the calibration automatically. After that, you track the markers. So basically, you stand in some kind of known pose. Usually, you stand in a T-pose. That's kind of easy to recognize. You can find all the markers. And once you find the markers and label them in the computer system, so you know that they are corresponding to your model, and then once you start moving from frame to frame, they move really little. Because if you have like 100, 200, or, or 1,000 frames per second um, during single transition between frame, they move really little. So if you just follow a marker where it moves and try to center the point in the middle of the marker, then you know the position of the uh, in the image. And from the images, you calculate where it is in 3D. And of course, from that, you get those trajectories. So for every marker, you get a trajectory of x, y, z coordinates in time. Um, and that's basically telling you how the body moved. Now, what we can compute from the model once we run it, uh, we can see the muscle activation pattern. So if you have a muscle model, uh, in the previous image here, you have an example of a model of a human, which have the bones plus joints and muscles. And here, muscles were represented as the straight lines of actions. For some exercises, it's good enough. So you can have muscle activation patterns to achieve certain motion. So you use the motion capture as a reference, and then you try to replicate the same motion using muscles in a forward dynamics. And when you do that, you can see the muscle activation pattern. So when it comes to activation pattern, you just see uh, how much the muscle is using its force from 0 to 
but you don't know the actual value of the force. If you know the scaling factor, so you know how strong is the guy, then you can actually collate the, calculate the absolute values, which is, are the muscle forces. Whenever the person is stepping on something, there's a contact force. If he's pushing something, there's a contact force. So those contact forces usually can be measured. So this is your friend, so your reference data that you can check that, okay, I measured that guy is pushing the door with that force. And now I'm simulating this and I see that the force is three times bigger. Something is off. So then I look at my parameters. So I look whether the door, I, I didn't make them heavier than in reality. I check the joint friction and everything. And then I figure out, okay, now it's good. So that's that's the way to go through that. Uh, you know the joint loading. From multi-body model, you can always find the forces in the joints. These are the constraint uh, values. You know the bone loading. So when you know that the joint above and below the bone have certain forces, you know what kind of forces are applied to the bone. And then you can calculate, OK, so this bone is subject to bending or some other stresses. And uh, if you put it to finite element model, you can see basically how it deforms. So again, so I kind of skip this to strains and stresses. So you Applying external loads, you see what happens internally. And there are also simulation which can, for example, simulate he uh, fracture healing. So when, once you break a bone, uh, the conditions for it to grow back together are not that easy. If you assemble it and it's totally rigid, the assembly, then it might not heal. So after several weeks, the healing process might not proceed at all. So there has to be some loading. So there has to be some compliance in the assembly part that you make, uh, and then the healing process actually starts. So the bone starts creating its uh, cells in, in places which are kind of loaded. So you need to have some residual loading for, for the healing. And that, that is something that happens from time to time that people got to um, yard and then they, they had some kind of a fracture. Uh, they, they get a cast or they get something else. And let's say a few weeks later, it's not healing. And the problem is that basically it's not assembled properly. So it, it's still black magic for some people because it's still done a lot with the feeling because you don't have the re range of values for a specific person. But once you would gather more information about this process, then you actually can um, give better guidelines for the doctors or medical personnel to um, help with the healing process better. How do we build the skeletal models? Um, you can start from scratch. So you can just get the geometry of the bones from somewhere and model everything. And that's that's doable. But there's lots of people who did the work already. And they measured a bunch of population. And they created databases. And in that database, if you take the height, gender, uh, ethnicality, age of a person, sometimes the, well, basically BMI comes from height and weight, uh, you get a model of a human skeleton, which will fit quite well. So basically, when the height is agreeing and the BMI is agreeing, then you get the weight distribution between the bones. Uh, you get the bone shape, which is decent. Of course, it's not perfect for the specific person, but it's very close. Then you can fine tune it with, uh, let's say, measuring individual body lengths. So you can see that some people have longer hands than the others. Um, so of course, on average, it's kind of the same and proportional, but you have some exceptional uh, people. Some people have larger heads. Some people have, I don't know, stronger legs than, than arms, sometimes the other way around, depending what you do. If you exercise, the things are also changing. So you can fine tune it. But basically, starting with those basic parameters, you can generate a skeleton like that. And it's not perfectly done, but the mass distribution is within the reason. Uh, you have the joints applied where they are supposed to be. And what you need there you need the muscle model. So then you add the muscles. And again, muscles are attached to specific landmarks. So there's not much differences if you take one person or another. So if you have a bone geometry, there are places where the muscles are attached. But muscles may be different size. So that's the part where you fine tune the muscle parameters, uh, set their strength, set their speed. Some people are faster, some are slower. So this reaction time and other parameters can be inserted to the model. And of course, joints here are represented by those balls and uh, muscles by the red lines. Now, before you build this model, you always have to consider what is the level of details that you really need. So let's say you want to study somebody doing a push-up. Then you need the whole body, really, because it's the, the whole body motion. Everything is loaded, and it's imported. But if you study somebody, for example, doing a squat without any loads in his hands, then 
the role of the hands is so limited that you could actually skip it or just assume that they are rigid. You don't have to have muscles there. You can just rigidly put the joints in one position. The same goes to the spine if it's, for example, in one position, or you might have one joint in the spine or, or two, not, not so many. Uh, head, neck, you can just group into sections instead of having all the spinal uh, elements. You could just have, let's say, one, two, three, few sections, and that's, that's good enough. The same goes for rib cage. You can just have it as a one big body. So that simplifies your model a lot. And when you can eliminate some muscles and say that they are rigid, of course, that's less computation. So you can, for example, then study a longer period. So you can simulate, for example, one hour of exercise changing something. You could focus on something else than uh, the model. Uh, you can study just a single segment. So if you, for example, want to see like how you're doing this exercise. So you just need the hand. If you have a support here, for example, then you can support it here. The rest of the body is totally unnecessary, so you can just eliminate it. And then you have a very simple model, and it's really nice, uh, robust thing to just try one body segment because you can play with the parameters when you're happy. You can, for example, apply it to the other side and just gradually build the whole body. Uh, the joint description, whether you are fine with kinematic joints or do you need to have contact joints with fancy ligaments and everything. So again, what you want to study? Do you, are you happy with just knowing what is the joint force? Or do you want to see the distribution of the force? So that's how you, you choose the, the level. Muscle geometry and model. You can have a straight lines of actions. And if you don't have big range of motion, that's fine. So if you have a straight arm and you're just bending it like this, then if the muscle is coming here straight, it doesn't change too much. But if you make the full body motion, or for example, in the knee, because the knee bends much uh, much more than, than the elbow, really, if you think about it, uh, then you want to have a muscle that kind of wraps around the joint. So basically, it doesn't go straight line. Because if it goes straight line, you can get funny situations like the muscle jumps from one side of the joint to another, and from being extensor becomes a flexor. So th that's quite spectacular failure mode, because then instead of straightening, you just kind of bend. Uh, totally, and I'll have. I think I have a short video showing that. Um, this is basically the process how you build the human model. So you have the anthropometric measurements to get the body. You can have flexible bones if you want to study the um, loads inside those bones, and that's how you get the human. And of course, you need to have joints, muscle, external forces, and contact models of different sort. So whatever is the external force applied, you just want to have a contact uh, model there so that you could see. Uh, how this force is uh, distributed. Now, how do we get the geometry? That's the tricky part. And most of the cases, if we have a living subject, we have two options. So one is computed tomography, that the other one is magnetic resonance. They look basically the same from the untrained uh, individual, but the operation is different. So basically, the difference comes from the fact that in magnetic resonance, what you see is uh, the water particles uh, content. And um, it's giving you information about the geometry, but nothing else. And some things are better visible than, uh, than the others. Now, in computed tomography, it uses x-rays. And the beauty of the x-rays is that um, depending on how much the x-ray is absorbed, in, for example, bone, you can actually correlate it with a density because bone doesn't have the constant density through all the surface. So it has less dense sections in the middle, more dense on the outside, so harder shell. And uh, to know the density distribution, you need to do the computed tomography. The other thing is that the computed tomography is far faster. So it takes several seconds to scan a leg with like really a lot of slices. If you try to do the same with magnetic resonance, it takes like 40 minutes. So imagine not moving for 40 minutes, because of course, if you move, you have an offset in your data. So you just have to support it and uh, make sure. I went through both procedures myself, and I have to admit that uh, it's uh, it's easier with, with CT. Of course, the negative effect is that you get some radiation dose. So that's something that you have to uh, take into account. But you get a little bit of extra information. So what you get from the machine is basically a stack of images. So this is, for example, in sagittal plane, but you can slice them in any plane you want because you have like voxels, which are 3D pixels. So you have a pixels in the 3D space. So you can basically slice them as ever you want to 2D images. And from there, you see that there is a contour of a bone and there is a muscle. So then you first trace those 
uh, contours. And after you have a lot of contours, you bring them to the CAD program, and then you fit a surface over that. And that's how you get the representation of, of a bone. This is quite time consuming. Even going through the stack of images, you have something like 1,000 images, and you have to go through all of them. The segmentation can be done partially automatically, but um, to do it fully automatically, there's always some, some problem, especially in the section where the bone is very not dense, so closer to the ends, and it's close to muscle tissue or fat because they appear on the images almost identical. So they are just some color of white. And distinguishing them is like, okay, I see that the border should be here. So in one picture you see it, but for example, a few pictures later you don't see it, so you just have to kind of copy paste uh, from the pictures and make some offsets. So there is certain inaccuracy there from people's judgment. So if you ask 10 people to do the same stack, they will come up with slightly different geometry, but up to the rule, it's it's quite quite okay. Uh, once you do the final element model out of this, so you have the geometry, you can mesh it, and if you want to use the um, mechanical joints, then you basically have to connect the surface, which you would apply normally the load to a single point, and that point is like your rotation center. So you use some kind of massless beams which connect the surface, and that's basically how you apply it to a normal joint. And in this particular example, you have tibia and fibula, and the number of elements is 21,000, 4,700 nodes. And the element is like 5 millimeters, so not very large. But that's a lot of degrees of freedom that you have to solve. So if you just solve this one, it's, it's okay. But if you try to solve it in the dynamic, um, that's, that's more difficult. Now, this is another example of uh, the, the longest bone that we actually have. And uh, femur is meshed here so that we have a really fine mesh in the next section. So we can see what are the stresses there because it's highly loaded. We have quite coarse mesh size in the middle. And here we have like 330,000 uh, elements and 65,000 nodes. So that's quite a lot. But that's also doable. Um, and, and usable in the simulation. So now if you think about it, we started with the multibody dynamics. And if you want to solve it, you have like, I don't know, 20, 50 bodies, uh, some amount of joints. So you just, for the machine, for, for the human body, the numbers are larger. So there's more joints. Well, the joints might be limited depending how detailed you are to get. Uh, but the number of bodies can be quite quite large if you if you also go to details. So that's kind of similar. But once you add the flexible structure, which is like twelve thousand degrees of freedom extra, um, so here you solve it just drinking a cup of coffee and you see the result. But in the other time, it just takes like time and time, and you can spend hours if you would like to solve the simulation. So you can you can go for a trip, come back, and then see that something crashed, and then start over. So it's not really a nice option to embed the full finite element model inside the multibody. And because of that, we use something called model reduction. And how we do it, we start with the volume again, like with normal finite element. Then we mesh it, add the material properties, then add those massless beams to the ends where we assume that there are center of joints. And do the model analysis. And from the model analysis, it's basically applying unit di di displacement to those joint points. And we get like how this bone can deform uh, under a unit loading. So there's different types of bending, stretching, uh, twisting, all those modes. And some modes have higher energy, so they are more likely to happen. Some have lower energy, so they are kind of a smaller contribution. But now if we use those deformation modes inside the multibody model, uh, then what we can do is reduce the number of degrees of freedom from like 12,000 to something like maybe 20. And that means that we can actually study the whole model uh, easily without uh, spending too much time on it. So how we build the simulation, we always start with the environment. So you have to do the exercise somewhere. So you have either exercising equipment or you have some other interaction points. So you just have to build them. You need the natural movement of the human or animal or whatever. And you need some verification data. And then you, of course, build the models of individual things. And then you just run the simulation. So how we get the environment? So exercising equipment and human subject 
we could call this environment. Natural movement we get from motion capture. Verification we can get from force sensors or some accelerometers, whatever sensors we can attach. And for the models, we need bones, joints, muscles, and contacts. That's the basic four that is always needed. Now we can look at this on also on another uh, level. So if we have a human model and motion capture, we can run inverse dynamics. So in inverse dynamic, we treat the human body like a puppet. And we just pull it by the markers which are attached and we do the motion. And then we see how the body is moving. So we can see what are the joint angles and we could even calculate somehow the loads uh, with the inverse dynamics. But if we add the flexible bones, we cannot use the inverse dynamics because there is a certain accuracy of the motion. And basically, when your markers are not perfectly accurate, and they never are because they even move with the skin, if you apply the motion of, let's say, palm with respect to the forearm, what you would see is that the markers either cause the compression here or extension. And those forces would be crazy. So what you have to do, you have to actuate it by muscles. And then you have the real bones attaching muscle forces, and then you can calculate what happens. So the flexible bones with the inverse dynamic results of the motion, you can combine and uh, go to forward dynamics. In forward dynamics, you use, for example, the joint angles that you estimated from inverse dynamics as your target. And then you try to control the muscle to get the same joint movements in time. And that way you figure out what are the forces in the muscles. And the body should move then actuate it in the realistic way. And then you see the forces in the flexible bodies and so on. So what you get as a result is the ground reaction forces, bone strains, muscle activities, joint loads, muscle forces, and a bunch of other whatever you can basically extract from, from a multibody model. So here are some examples. and. Uh, let me see if they start. If not, I will just play them from outside. OK, so here they are not playing perfectly. I think I have them in the folder, so I can just run them. OK, let's start from this one. Hopefully it runs. I should start it with a different one. OK, so here is bicycling on a stationary bicycle. And you can see that we removed the whole body of the guy, so the mass is concentrated on the pelvis, because he's sitting on the seat. Uh, we modeled the pedals and, and the crank. Is it moving? Ah, oh, no, it's disconnecting because of this one. And it's irritating a little bit, so I'll do it like this and connect. And let's see if this is going well. OK. Oh, now it's running. So basically, he's pedaling. So that's just the lower body uh, with the muscles. And what we had, we had a sensors on the pedals to measure the forces that he's creating during bicycling. And the guy was a soccer player. Um, as a hobby. So what you cannot see from the motion, but you could see from the dynamics, he was using one leg almost twice as much force than on the other, which is quite a big difference, I would say. But that's 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 what's happening. Uh, now, this is another. Hopefully this starts. This is an example for showing basically how to treat the contact. So the guy is not fixed to the bench. He's actually being held by contact forces. So there is this kind of a masses which represent his skin and body. And there's contact between them and all the elements here of the training equipment. And that's how he's making this, this movement. But uh, to get the movement done, how did we, we didn't actually measure this exercise in the lab. Uh, the model was artificially kind of driven. So there was basically a rope here pulling him uh, up in the inverse dynamic as a kind of a training thing. And then once we see that, what is the motion we want to get? In the forward dynamics, he actually used muscles to do that exercise. And that's that's one of the short things that we can get. Uh, that's not the one. Let me see if this is somehow interesting. Uh, 
Yeah, this is just a motion capture, so that's nothing, nothing special. So I have probably the other videos in another folder. Mm, here, that's why they didn't play. So this is what happens when you have a straight line of motion in the uh, joints, uh, I mean in the in the muscles. So at this point, he actually started to use the same muscle as the opposite direction. And basically, then you get a total failure of the model. Well, he kind of recovered, but <laughs> looks not really realistic. But still, the simulation environment showed absolutely no problems. It's just simulated. That's the reality and then live with it. So that's what you have to always find some kind of... A, Wait, so here you can see that the muscles are basically going through all the things and then he's falling. So once he started sliding, he basically the, he had only contact model in his feet. So of course he's falling through the floor. Um, this is an inverse dynamic. Let me see it here. So this is inverse dynamic, just the lower body. One of the first things we did just walking. So basically what we recovered from motion capture, it looked quite decent, I would say. Uh, I can just play it again. One thing that was visible from here, because the feet were rigid. So because of that, we saw the toes being dragged on the floor, because normally you don't lift the feet more from the floor than you need. That's why we are tripping while walking, because you just have a small carpet on the floor, and then it's like, I don't know, five millimeters off, and it's like people are tripping over it because they don't feel that they should be marching, lifting their feet like half a meter from the ground. And that's that's part of the problem sometimes. Then here we get another one, leg extension. So here we have an exercising device. There's a flexible bone, and there's a contact between it and the, and the exercising equipment. And we see the torque being applied, which simulates the movement of the weights. And when he's exercising, basically, uh, here we just hit the muscles. But the upper body muscles were not needed. The other leg muscles were not really needed. So the only muscles in this one leg were needed to, to simulate how he's exercising and um, how this whole thing is behaving during the simulation. Uh, then there's a leg press. So the leg press is kind of similar in this case. So we have again some force simulation for the to simulate the contact. There's a sliding con basically a contact surface under the leg, so he can actually move the leg with respect to that. We see those arrows which represent the contact forces. There are some colors on the um, bone, so you can see basically where it's loaded the most. So the middle of the bone has the highest loading. Um, then we have running. So this is running inverse dynamics. So you can see that the forces are coming quite quite high whenever he's hitting the ground. And then open with. This is squatting with a weight. You can see that the fingers are open, and just because we didn't have more accurate hand models, so basically he was rigidly attached. Because the guy was holding firmly the, the barbell, there's no uh, a risk that anything will move. So basically we rigidly attach it to his hands. And the legs were, the contact in the ground was modeled with bushing elements because he was standing firmly. So you see the forces and thing, and he's being held in place by that. Of course, you don't need the barbell um, whole visualization. You just need to know what is the weight and how it's distributed uh, to get it right. But then you can see basically what's happening in the uh, muscles and what's happening um, inside the, the human body. Mm, successful walking. Let's see this one. So this is walking only lower body. Also one of the first studies. It took quite a while before it actually becomes stable. So most of the time, basically, the, high, the guy is falling down. He just trips over the floor and uh, 
falls down or just loses the stability. There's there's lots of things which you have to consider to actually get it stable. And those balls on his feet are basically the contact elements for the ground reaction force uh, simulation. So this is what he's standing on this. Um, this is some failure with walking. So let's see this one. So when, when things don't go well, I don't know if this would be the right perspective to see it. It was quite slow here, so that's expected to move that slowly. Ah, so basically he's tripping. And now he's just falling down. So if you don't have the right uh, contact parameters, and if you don't have enough stabilization at the pelvis to, to keep him afloat, basically the, the model is falling. Walking is quite difficult uh, because with walking, you're standing often on one leg. The other one is in the air. And the points where you have the contact are not that. And here is this complex uh, femur model, which you could see before. Uh, just the muscles are hidden to, to show it. So here the guy was walking, and we could actually see the stresses and strains inside uh the femur bone during walking okay walking inverse was not that interesting i'm just looking if there's anything okay we'll just leave it at here let's see if this goes yep And I don't want the presenting. OK. So basically, these were the examples that I, I showed there. And hopefully, I can go to the next slide. OK, it doesn't go like this. So um, there was here, oh, here is jumping. We can show that that way. So hopping in one place, uh, also quite difficult to keep it stable because you have a flying phase. And during flying, basically, your arms and whole body is used to kind of keep a balance. So what uh, mostly the model would like to do is fall to one or the other direction. Now, what you can do, you can actually add a virtual sliding joint somewhere in the back. So that's how you can stabilize him from falling or just calculate the forces needed for that. Um, otherwise, you get into really complex issue of how to control the arms uh, to stabilize the flying phase. And most of the time, these are like really, really small forces that just keep it stable. Because in simulation, you just put a little bit of poke in the back, and there's no nothing to constrain it from falling. So that's how he's hopping. Um, uh, from current slides. OK, and these are some results from walking. So when it comes to walking, you can see there are a few phases. So there's a double support phase, so when you stand on both legs for a short duration. There's a single support where your one leg is swinging in the air and the other one is moving. And then a ga the gay double support. Uh, for every leg, you have the part where you have a heel strike. When you heel strike with, with the heel, then you have a swing and uh, and stance stands when you're standing on that leg. Uh, so yeah, here there, this was better for this one. So heel strike, then there is a stance, uh, then there is a toe off and so on and swing. Anyway, these are the stresses here in the middle of the bone on the four different locations or like six different locations. So this is like the cross section here. And then you have the curves which represent those cross sections. So what you can see on the strains that they get positive on one side of the bone and negative on the other. And if you look at the maximum value here, positively, it's like 1,000. And uh, negatively, it's maybe 1,200. So from what you can see from there is that the leg is compressed because the whole thing is moving down. So there is a compression on all sides. And then there's bending. And bending is the dominating load. So here is the beginning, where is the double support phase. So when we're standing at the, at the leg. and there are two peaks. So the first peak basically means when you strike with the heel. And the second peak here is when you're making a toe off. So you're pushing yourself forward. And they are more or less similar. 
Then when the leg is in the air, basically the strains go to, to small things. It's just the inertia and the muscle compression that is basically holding it together. And then you're preparing for the next heel strike. So the dominating load in bone here is bending, not the compression. Compression, there is a small amount, but mostly there is bending. For knee flexion, we did it like at three different levels of force and uh, speed. The speed was adjusted by the human. It's difficult to tell that do it like with a specific pace. We didn't have any specific uh, way, just ask him to do it slowly and fast. So basically the slow and fast is most distinct. So in, when you try to do it slowly, what you see is that there's a lot of ticks in the forces and that's because of the muscle twitch. So when you try to apply the force gently, you're just applying those force impulses and uh, going antagonistically with the muscles. And that's why you get this kind of uneven. When you apply the fast, what you do is just you apply the maximum force or like the force you feel you need. So it kind of goes smoothly. And then uh, what happens in the unloading phase, you just apply the braking force so that you don't want to hit the end point. And this is where... Uh, the, the peaks are coming. So first peak is just accelerating. Then you're like breaking in the point. You, you just try to uh, reach the breaking point and then you go back uh, with the unloading. And then again, you apply force in breaking. While you try to do it like in a medium speed, you have more of those peaks because you're trying to kind of control. So you feel, oh, too fast. So I'm trying to go slower. And then you're applying the, the forces to the muscle. So it, it seems from there that doing it slow or fast, it uh, makes some sense if you want to have a specific loading doing it in the medium speed it's more like frustrating because you're uh, trying to control something that is not that easy uh, then knee extension so basically the force is applied in a different way and you can see that the offset is happening where the force is applied and here the medium was basically almost identical to the fast uh, that's that's how the guy did it um, one thing is that if you try to do it quickly you're kind of optimizing uh, how you go to the turning point to get a kind of a neutral so you produce less you, you put less stresses to your leg than if you try to do it slowly with slowly you you're just at some point pushing a lot of force uh, just to keep it steady and otherwise you just use the inertia of the of the weight flying one way and another uh, so some summaries about so flexion and extension which one was more difficult to perform which one was easier um, and also the sensitivity to the speed that the user is selecting. Um, the peak strains are also compared and also what is the dominating. So um, in the flexion, there's a dominating compression at the initial phase and uh, in the extension, it was bending. So slightly different, uh, different loading scenario. Now, there was also a study that we did with the animal and we took the Savanna monitor Varan. It's quite a large animal. It's like, I don't know, a meter long or something. Um, its walking style is quite funny because it can walk like crocodile, either lift his body and walk in the ground or just lie on his belly and, and kind of move on the ground sliding. So that makes it really complicated. Mm, of course, there's no protocol how to attach the markers to that kind of animal. So we attach the markers so that we try to get the position of the head and every body segment. But there is lots of lots of uh, gotchas with his uh, legs because how he's walking, he's just putting the feet like that and then he drags it over the other side. So if you put any marker on top of the feet, basically he'll just rip it off by accident. He didn't try to remove the markers. And of course, how do you control the animal to walk over force platforms and other stuff? That's that's a tremendous uh, job. So you, you have to make, you have to be really patient. Uh, so the tail is basically half of the body length. So that's, that's how, how big it is. And well, first thing is to measure the animal so that you can get some model out of it. So we didn't have any geometry. We didn't get any permit to make a CT scan because to make a CT scan of the animal, you have to first put him to sleep and then do the CT scan. And because of the scientific value, it's like not really justified to, to bring the animal to some uh, uh, like whole body anesthetics uh, and, and radiation. Nowadays, this wouldn't be a problem. There is a huge database of different animals available made by one of the American universities. They spend quite a lot of money and effort for that. 
and it's publicly available where you have the bones um, from like, lots of lots of animals. And uh, I'm planning to use it actually at some point to use the data that we had there uh, to do the more accurate model. So after the measurement with the tape and uh, different calipers and stuff, we could get the geometry of the specimen. And and this is how it looks when he when you try to ask him to walk through the force plates. The, the floor in the lab was all wooden and the force plates were metal. And you can imagine that he just tries to get closer. OK, it's going. So he tries walking over that. And once he realizes that the metal is kind of cold and not nice to walk, he's not going to walk over force plates. The other thing is the size of the force plates compared to the size of the animal. It's really difficult to get a measurement of a single leg on a single force plate. So if you would like to have the whole walking face, here he was walking nicely. He just lifted his belly. So the belly didn't contribute directly to the loading. But in some other places, uh, he was walking differently. This animal was very calm. As you could see, he didn't have any problems. Uh, but understanding for him that he should walk straight was a problem. And we couldn't put some barriers because of the cameras next to it. So if we put barriers, then of course this wouldn't work. But he can start running quite quickly. So if he decides to catch something, then we would be running after him quite a while. Fortunately, that didn't happen. But as you can see, he was exploring slowly. There. And of course, you can do it for some time, then he gets tired. That's that's end of the story for the day. So one of the things that came up from there is basically we had two measurement sessions with some like 12 captures per session, not to tire him too much. I think that they were organized over two different days so that the animal have some time to rest. Uh, we used altogether 25 markers to mark his body and see how it's deforming. Um, the marker sizes, even though those markers were relatively small, there were some problems close to the head. Those markers on the cameras appeared to be sometimes in the same spot. So uh, that makes it difficult. So it would be nice to use, let's say, one third of this marker size and higher resolution cameras. And then uh, you could get more accurate representation of this and markers should not disappear. Um, Markers on the feet, really hard. You can see even in this pose that he's stretching his legs. And um, there's only a way to attach a marker somewhere here on the side. But nothing on top, nothing on the bottom, because he will just uh, detach it by accident. Uh, the animal is quite cooperative. Uh, the only thing is to convince it to do what you want. It might take a while uh, to do a good trial. Making a trial where we would be able to measure the ground reaction force in all the places would only be possible with a force sensing mat. So there would be a mat and you would have a pressure um, distribution. Then, of course, you just have one component. That's the downside. So you don't have three components in every point. You just have one vertical component. With a force plate, you have all three components and the um, uh, torques. But um, well, they are relatively large. So you cannot have it so that there's one leg only. So if you ever decide to make an animal study, reserve a lot of time and patience because it will take time. But I have to admit that it is quite an interesting experience in general. So that's that's it from today. And I think I had just one, one, one study, which is kind of in the border of uh, biomechanics. Uh, and industrial engineering. So this is an example where we have a human model in a, let's say, simulated factory environment. And the idea is that the guy is supposed to do certain actions and we can time it. So we can prepare the assembly procedure. And what you can see on the top is basically the instruction he's getting. And on the side, uh, there are sub steps that are automatically derived uh, from that instruction based on the current setting. So if you move the boxes around here and you just have the same instruction, there will be a different set of actions that he have to make and they are automatically derived. And his motion is here synthesized from short motion clips that are combined together automatically. And this is also one interesting uh, place for, let's say, kinematic analysis, because from there you can learn, first of all, what is the ergonomic of the work environment? You can see what is the time needed to do the assembly. 
So normally you just have some kind of uh, standards that's okay, assembly of a small part takes this many seconds. But if you just move the things around, depending how you organize the workplace, this might be different time. If there are, for example, two workers and they share some tools, there might be some glitches that they need the same tool at the same time. And with the simulation, you can actually plan it ahead and make sure that they are not disturbing to each other. And of course, that's that's the thing. So that's something that was active in the recent few years as a simulation uh, idea. This was made in a gaming engine, Unity. And quite interestingly, this, this actually works. And several larger uh, car making companies are actually interested in using this concept. And they are actually starting a new project uh, related to, to that idea. So as you could see, the, the applications of biomechanics are really wide. It starts from uh, small things up to large scale industrial and, and sports engineering. And I hope that this is good enough introduction for you so that more or less you know that this is an interesting topic that you can study and you can just select something that really fits your, fits your needs. So thank you very much. And if there would be any questions, uh, you can always send by email or ask and I'll try to try to give you some answers. If you have something now, then of course, feel free to ask. Hands are difficult, uh, mostly because if you try to make a motion capture, you need some kind of a detailed system for the hands. There are some gloves that you can use uh, for simulating hands. Um, if you think about simulating grasping actions, this is a little bit uh, difficult. But the benefit of simulating hands is that you have usually a stable body posture. So if you're simulating hands, you assume that the body is kind of fixed somehow. So you only think about the mechanics here and, and how you're grasping. So if you would like to simulate how you grasp different objects without having any data, that's a challenging task because you have to figure out all the degrees of freedom, how you control them to grasp something. If you have the motion capture, it's easy. Yeah. Yeah, there, there's lots of bones in the hand. That's that's one of the things. And the other thing is uh, the complexity of the motion. And the motions are coupled. So most of the fingers, you cannot just make the motion of individual joints. You always come, uh, make few joints move at the time. And this also differs between people. So some have a little bit more flexibility, some have less. Um, the easy part is that the body is stable. Whenever you have an exercise when you're walking or locomoting or running or jumping, the difficult part is how do you keep the balance? Keeping the balance is not trivial. So you can always, and this is the, the most used technique, is basically you just add, you, uh, add some residual forces to the center of mass, which stabilize the body. So if your contacts are not perfect, you will still have some extra forces in the body like somebody is holding you. And as long as they are small, it means that the, the, the model is OK. And that's like for numerical stability. But if you try to make a body that is walking or running using just the contacts and using some fancy algorithm for figuring out the stability, that's extra difficult. Because even determining the contacting surfaces on the legs is, is hard. Because you would practically need to replicate it one to one with the real human. Because if you change the slightly geometry of the, where the contacts are, your motion capture is not matching the reality. And basically, if you try to replicate the motion capture, you will have a fall. So that's, that's the difficult. Anything that happens in a seated position or when you're supported somehow and then you're just moving around with your body points is not that difficult because you can just apply the motion to the... Like in the simplest case, you can apply the motion to the joints. So you can just drive the joints without muscles. That doesn't give realistic forces in the, mu in the, muscle, in, in the bones, but it gives you realistic motion. So if you're just studying motion, it's, it's completely fine. And with the hands, um, we have an editor for actually uh, specifying the hand poses for grasping things just for that project uh, with the industry. So that if you're holding something, you, you have an object, and then you can attach the hand and just play with the fingers to put them attached. And we're adding actually some intelligence there so that when we put the hand object and we say grasp it, it should just close the fingers until it touches and try to find one of the, let's say, reasonable poses, uh, having some data of, of the typical poses that people are using for grasping. 
So grasping is not that bad. It's more difficult if you would like to make an actuator like a human hand, then you end up with a complexity of the design. But if you're simulating human hand motion and how it grasps things, I think it's 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 decent. It's somehow middle range. The the stability I would say is the most most difficult whenever you try to jump somewhere and land or if you try to to walk or run. That starts to be hard. Especially if you have the situation like in running that you have both uh, legs up the ground because that's the flying phase and the only thing you can actually stabilize is use the air drag use your hand and in inertia and stuff and that's uh, that requires a lot of a lot of small models to be added and then fine-tuned and it, it's really difficult to get this all working okay so thank you very much everyone and Hopefully that brings your interest to the topic a little bit. Thank you.